this past week I was going home after a long day, and I was not in the best of moods. Now, you all have your own days like that, so I won't bore you with the details. But let's just say that I wasn't feeling like I wanted to see anyone or talk to anyone. I uh, stopped at the Piggly Wiggly in Plymouth uh, to pick up a couple of items to make for dinner that night. And as I'm leaving, I have just these few things, and so I find the shortest line I can. I just want to get home, get my shoes off. You know, it's the feeling, right? So I'm in this line, and there's just this one woman ahead of me, and she's talking to the clerk. She has just a few items, too. But with each item, the conversation seems to go on between the clerk and this customer who must have known each other, and they're talking about just about everything I think that could possibly be going on in their lives. And I, meanwhile, am steaming behind, looking at the other lines and so forth. You know the idea, right? Well, that transaction is finally complete, and the women then turn and look at me, and without saying any word, their looks were sufficient to say, hey, mister, cool down. So I walk up to the counter, and I put my couple of items that I've been holding in my hands for all this time, and this clerk says to me, my, don't you look nice today. Did you get all dressed up just for me? <laughs> this is a true story. What a beautiful day this has been. Are you going home to enjoy the beautiful evening tonight? What do you have planned for tonight? And I, my head, of course, can't get any lower at this point. And as she wraps up my couple of items, puts them in the bag, and I'm walking out, she says, thank you for coming to visit me today. And I said, thank you. And all I could think was, I'm glad she doesn't know I'm a minister. At least I hope she doesn't. I'll have to be careful when I go there next. You see, love one another is a command for a reason. It's not a suggestion. It's not like Jesus says, you know, now Bill, if it's not too much trouble, one thing you could do for me is love one another. It's not advice for happy living like you'd find on, you know, uh, Oprah or someplace like that where, where they would say, well, you know, here are your ten steps to find happiness in life. Love somebody. No. Jesus knew enough about being a human from his own experience of temptation to watching people on earth for 33 years, right, that his final sermon, which this is, his final sermon is a command a tenderly delivered command, but a command nonetheless. Love one another. He knew people would have a really hard time living it out. And that's why it's in the Bible. Because we need this reminder. A regular reminder of just how it is that we Easter people are supposed to live. Okay, we have the joy of Easter. What are we supposed to do with it? My point is this, if it was natural, if it was easy, well, then we wouldn't need a command, would we? Loving one another is not easy. It's not natural. It leads to a broken heart. So it's not too hard to conclude that the price of love is just too high. C.S. Lewis captures the thought just like this. He says, to love at all, to love at all, is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to be sure of keeping your heart intact, you must, not, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. 
Wrap it up carefully with your hobbies, with your little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. That's how you can protect your heart. But as soon as you allow your heart to love another, you are opening yourself up to being broken. And Jesus knew it. And that's why it's a command. To love someone, even an animal, is a risky business. And we humans are risk avoidance beings. So it's a command, not suggestion, not advice, that Jesus gives as his final three-sentence sermon. This sermon is more than three sentences. Jesus knew when to give this sermon. He waited until he was gone, the Bible tells us. And the he there is Judas, when he, Judas, was gone. This is the Thursday night before the Friday on which Jesus is going to die. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, why in the world would we have this Monday Thursday passage on the fifth Sunday of Easter? I wondered that myself when I first read it, and I think I have an answer. I'll tell you a little bit later on. But I think that's a good question we need to ask ourselves. Why on Easter 5 do we celebrate the word of the Lord that comes on Monday, Thursday? We'll figure that out shortly. But anyway, Jesus' sermon comes when Judas was gone. You know, Judas is one of those names that I don't need to tell you who Judas is, right? Everybody knows who Judas is. If I say Jehoiakim or somebody like that, I have to go into a long story about who they are. Abinadad or whatever, you know, a long explanation. But the one name in the Bible other than Jesus, just about everybody in the world, Christian or non-Christian, knows is Judas. When Judas was gone, Jesus knew something had started. When Judas left, at that very moment, it hit Jesus like a ton of bricks. It had begun. Now, he says. Now, he says, the Son of Man, Jesus, now. It's not later. It has begun at that moment. When Judas leaves the room, now, now it has begun. Jesus is glorified. And notice the present tense, right? Jesus is glorified. It's not something that's going to happen on the day of resurrection. It's starting now. It is now. When Judas has left, the glorification has begun. Jesus is glorified, and God is glorified when Judas is gone, when Judas leaves the room. Does that sound like a moment of glory to you? He's just been abandoned by one of his 12 best friends who's going to turn him into the authorities so that Jesus will be turned in to die, and now he is being glorified. Well, part of the problem is our misunderstanding or inability to understand the word glory. The word glory has, you know, lost almost all meaning as originally intended in Scripture. You see, when Jesus talks about glory, that God is glorified, that Jesus is glorified, what he means is that he is now going to go out and suffer and die and rise and ascend. But the glorification begins with suffering. The beginning of glory begins with sacrifice. If you want to know the glory of God in your life, ask yourself, what sacrifice have I made? What have I done to earn the glory? You see, we hear the word glory, and it has a whole different meaning. We hear the word glory, we think about People magazine, we think about the Oscars, we think about the Tonys, we think about the famous people in the world. Well, the next time you hear Lady Gaga sing, I'm on the edge of glory, remember that's not the meaning of glory in the Bible. When we sing to God be the glory, we mean honor and praise and blessing that is beyond human experience. 
which is due to God alone. But I digress. Back to the story. As Judas walks out that door, as Judas walked out that door, Jesus knew that the end was very near. So he tells his friends, I will be with you only a little while longer. We all know that feeling, right? Those of you who sit with those who are about to die in your family or if that's your work, you know what this feeling is like to sit with someone who is about to leave the earth. It's bittersweet at best. We know what lies ahead is better, but we don't want to lose our friend. And Jesus, in his humanity, understood that emotion, probably felt that emotion right then. This is a moment I wish I would not have to face. I will only be with you a little while longer. But feeling overwhelmed by the knowledge that his glory is now finally being revealed, as Jesus feels the apprehension of leaving his friends on earth, he concludes it is now time. Now is the time to speak what is on his heart. You know, a lot of writers have observed this, which we all might think about. Why would Jesus say this instead of something else? Why would Jesus not choose as his sermon, come out and die with me? Keep the faith, be strong. Go out and preach to all the world about who I am. Why does Jesus choose as the centerpiece of his final sermon before his death the very simple command? the very simplest of commands, that we are to love one another. He says it's a new command. The command, of course, has been in the Bible. It's all over the place in the Bible. As early as Leviticus, love each other, love others as you love yourself. What makes this command new is that it happens to say not as you love yourself. But instead, Jesus just says, love one another. What makes it new is the focus of the command is not yourself. The focus of the command is not what you would do for yourself. While that certainly is a true and wonderful teaching of the Bible, what Jesus is giving us is something new. As Jesus is about to leave the world, he says, the focus is not on yourself. The focus is on another. Love one another. And then there's this word, as. Well, that's a word that should make us shake in our boots. There is no more powerful word in Scripture than that word, as, right there at this particular point in his sermon. As, as you know, is a word of comparison. And in this case, Jesus is saying, as, to get us to the point of comparison. Jesus says, as he says that word, as, Jesus is asking us to draw into our minds what he has done, washing the feet of the disciples, including Judas, who would betray him sacrificing his life for the world, doing without a home, doing without a job, leaving his family to go into ministry. All of these things are combined into the word as. Jesus is saying as, and as we're shuddering as we hear that word, as I have loved you. As Jesus has loved you, he follows it up with the word so. And there is the challenge for us. As Jesus has done this, so. Therefore, now you, what are we to do? Love one another. You know, I wonder why Jesus didn't say, I want you to get all of these facts in the Bible right. 
And I want you to hold everybody to the same understanding of the Bible. And anybody who disagrees with what you think about the Bible, you tell them that's wrong, and they're not Christians. Why didn't Jesus say that? Why didn't Jesus say, you know, someday John Calvin's going to come along and only the people who follow the doctrine of John Calvin are true Christians. Why didn't he say that? Or the Catholics. Why didn't he say only the Roman Catholic Church is a real church and you should fight wars about it. In fact, you should, you should go at each other's throat to, under, to defend the faith. Why didn't he say that? Jesus didn't say, spend your life arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a needle. Jesus said, love one another. I think if the church could get that right, there would be a lot of people attracted to the church. You know what people don't like about the church? They feel like all the church is going to do is tell them that they have to do something they don't want to do. They're going to accuse them of doing something bad in their life. There's all, there are probably a thousand reasons. If there's a thousand people who don't come to church, there are a thousand reasons why. And the main one, I think, though, that would be under all of them is that we have failed to convey this most basic idea. The point of the church is to love one another. You know, if what you want is people who think like you, you can join a political party. If you want people who enjoy the same hobbies you do, you can join the garden club, you can join the book club. Those are all wonderful things. Do it. Do it. Be involved. But if what the church should be is a place not where everybody thinks the same way. We don't want everybody who thinks just like I do. Because what do I know? Right? Not everybody should think like me. Not everybody should have my hobbies. Why should you get frustrated wasting four hours on some stupid golf course? You have your own ways to waste your time. But what we all should do, what should be the organizing principle of this church and every church is that we love one another. That is the message that Jesus is saying. These other things are important in their time. Our understanding of the Bible is certainly important. Our understanding of doctrine is certainly important. But Jesus made a point in his final sermon to talk about one thing, that you love one another. You love one another. You love people who don't talk the same language as you. You love people who have different skin color from you. You love people who live in different homes than you. You love people who live in different countries than you. You love people who have different views of sex, who have different views of finances, who have different views of the values in life. Love people who are different than you because that's the only way you are going to attract them to the love of Jesus Christ. If the beginning point of inviting someone to a relationship with Jesus Christ is first you have to be just like me, how many people are going to do that? Not many. The love of Jesus Christ has to be for the world. God so loved the world, not everybody who agrees. And that's the challenge of the church. We want to make the church a political institution. We want to make the church a social institution. When Jesus says it is a love institution for a reason, he says this. By this. By loving one another. This is the kind of love he commands as the actions his friends are to do when he is gone. By this, by this kind of love. You see, actions teach and explain more than any doctrine in the world. The smartest religion, religious folks in the world will not attract nearly as many people to Christ as the people who show love. The best preachers in the world, the smartest men and women in the world who preach the word, 
will not attract nearly as many people to Christ as people who show love in the world. By this, by your loving one another, everyone will know. Everyone will know. You see, it's not just people who agree with me. It's not people who view the Bible the same way I do. It's not people who view doctrine the same way I do. It's everyone. Jesus Christ has a heart for everyone. No matter what your past is, no matter where you've been, what you've done, what relationships you've had, Jesus wants you to know he loves you. It begins with love. It ends with love. By this, everyone will know you are my disciple. That's the last sermon. Love one another because this is how people will know you are my disciple. The love Jesus is talking about is a sacrificial love. The love that brings glory. We're not talking about being on the edge of glory that comes from Lady Gaga love. We're talking about being on the edge of bringing glory to the Lord and Savior of the universe by demonstrable acts of servant love by people we do not by nature love. Do you hear that? I don't know which is harder for you. If I say love your family or love people outside of your family, for some of you loving your family might be harder. God gets that. Love them anyway. For some of us, loving people outside of our family, outside of our very circle is, is harder. God says love them anyway. Love without judgment. Love with an inviting love. Open the doors and invite them in expecting nothing in return. It doesn't escape my notice that this passage comes before us as we are in our second Sunday of remembering Pastor Phil's challenge to Hope Church, as I talked about at his funeral. We don't want to be just a friendly church. All the churches are friendly, right? What we want to be is a caring community. A caring community. It doesn't escape my notice that this passage comes to us as an Easter story, as I said before. I think that's the case, because the only way this can happen is if we have resurrection power in our life. The love that only Easter people can offer to the world is a matter of obedience and determination. It is a conscious decision we must make together. That's why it's a command. What I am encouraging us to do, what I believe Jesus is commanding us to do, is not something that comes to us naturally. It isn't something, going out to love people different than us is not something easy. It is not something that human beings are made to do. We need the resurrection power, the newness of life that comes for Easter people. There's a book and a movie called Out of Africa. And uh, in that book, there is this story that is told about uh, a boy named Katao. And the author, uh, the author's name in, is uh, Isak Dennis. And so the author is telling this story about Katao. So Katao appears at uh, the author's door and asks for a job as a domestic servant. So she hires him, and here's the example I want to leave you with that someone is watching this. She hires Katao, and three months later, the servant boy, who's worked faithfully, done a great job, she loves having him there, he asks for a letter of recommendation. So he can bring it to Sheikh Ali bin Salim, a Muslim in a nearby town. Well, she's distraught, confused. She offers him a raise, says, no, 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 you're doing a great job. Let me keep you here. You see, Isak is a Christian. And she wants to keep him there. And, and she loves the fact that this little boy has learned about Christianity as she's watched him. So she offers him more money, but Katao says, well, that's not the point in my asking for the letter. 
And he explains that he has decided, this boy, to become either a Christian or a Muslim. And his purpose in working for Isaac has been to see up close the way a Christian lives. And now that he had worked for her and seen the ways of Christians, he would go and observe the way that Sheikh Ali lives, to see how Muslims behave. And then he would decide which faith to follow. Well, he reflected wishing that he had told her that before he came to live with her. You see, the reputation of Hope Church, your reputation as disciples, is always being watched by someone. Someone is making a decision about whether to follow Jesus Christ in the checkout lane at the pig or pick and save wherever you go. In your workplace, the person next to you on the assembly line, the person next to you in the hospital room, they are all watching. And they are basing their evaluation of Jesus and his church on what they see in your life. So my friends, if it is true that someone is watching you, show them the love of Christ. Remember, it's a command. Dear children, love one another. 